Good morning and welcome to the Marine Recreational Fisheries Development Panel Meeting um, for December 6, 2021. At this time, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And the first uh, point of order will be, I'd like to um, introduce, uh, first I'd like to say, we, we have a time limit. Uh, we, we're, we're scheduled to end at 11 o'clock. So I'd like to, as best as possible, First to all keep to our allotted schedule, the time schedules that are on the agenda. Uh, with that said, I'd like to recognize Commissioner Ron Avedon for opening remarks. Good morning, Khalil, and uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure uh, some of you folks have, uh, as I've heard from many of you, wondered uh, about my future with uh, the announcement that we've received from the administration. Um, I got a lot of work still left on my plate, so I don't plan on going anywhere. So you got me for a while longer, whether you like it or not. Hopefully, uh, those decisions will be made by people much higher up than me. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'll be around to help you folks with all your initiatives as, as long as I possibly can. And uh, with that, Mr. Bogdan, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I appreciate it. At this time, I'd like to have a motion to approve the December 6, 2021 draft meeting agenda. And please state your name when you make the motion and a second. Mike Pernock, motion to approve. Second, please. Kevin Blinkoff, motion to second. Thank you, Kevin. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? I'm just going to assume that it's, it's going to be a unanimous vote for in favor of it. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to um, have a motion to approve the, two, the May 20th, 2021 draft meeting minutes. But before we do that, I would like to thank Nicola for being the minute manager at the May 20th meeting and for providing us with the draft meeting minutes. I have a motion to approve. Patrick, you have your hand up. Um, is, was that to uh, comment on the minutes? Yes, I'm going to do that with uh, any, uh, further discussion. It's right there. It's right there. That's Mike Moss. Thank you. Any second? May I have a second? Patrick Paquette will second. Okay. Are there any, any further discussion, corrections, or additions to the meeting minutes? Hearing none, uh, anybody opposed to the minutes, to the draft of meeting minutes? With that, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna move right along in the agenda to item number two, recreational permitting updates. And I'm gonna turn this over to the first item to Commissioner Amazon. We're gonna, get an, we're gonna get an update on the alternative fee structure for permits. Good morning, Cleo. Yes, uh, the fee structures, as we have discussed, have been sent up through EEA to the administration. Um, we have asked that we find a way to reimburse for all of the free licenses that are issued, similar to what we were able to accomplish with the Inland Fish and Game Fund uh, and those license fees. We have also began the process of reaching out to legislators to see if there's any interest in changing the legislation relative to uh, the age at which free licenses are issued, as well as the cost of the licenses themselves. So that process is still underway. Uh, we have several different legislators who are currently working with yeah, as that continues to unfold, we'll keep you posted. There's no progress on it at this time. But uh, as far as the reimbursements go, there does seem to be uh, interest in uh, accomplishing that task. Thank you.
Khalil, if you're speaking, you're on mute. But are there are there any questions uh, yes, for I, the commissioner? Excuse me. Excuse me. I was I went on. That's my mistake. I'm sorry. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. At uh, this time, we're going to move to item B, 2021 permit issuance. Mike Armstrong. Okay. Um, the, the things we're going to go over, I'm going to go over very quickly, um, you know, for the sake of time, but please weigh in. This one is very simple. It's just showing the number of permits um, we sell in the different categories and the growth. And the big thing for this year, of which, you know, we might sell a couple more in December, but not very many. So we're down 10% from last year. Um, and we were up 10% last year. Um, so we're back to pretty close to the normal level, maybe down just a little bit. We've, we've lost a few. Um, so we lost a lot of non-residents last year and now they've popped back some um and we gained a lot of residents during the pandemic which is still going on um and then we lost some of those we lost twenty four thousand going into this year interestingly the 60 plus residents just keeps kind of chugging along we're actually up again and i believe that in and story or Kevin weigh in. Um, I think that's just the bubble of the baby boomers moving into the 60 plus um, group, as opposed to us recruiting new fishermen. Um, so that'll keep going up for just a little bit more. And uh, so anyway, at the uh, end of it all, we're pretty much what we were in 2019. And that's okay. Any questions about that? All right. Should we move to the next, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot I had a revenue. Um, Two, and this is this is this is fiscal year, not calendar year. Um, but you see, we had a big bump up last year, um, but we're actually making more than we did in 2019. So that's that's a good thing. Thank you. Can you tell us who we're working with on that legislation? Mike, was that was that for Ron? You, I yeah, think you asked what legislators are, is, are we working with. Yes, that's what I asked. Mike, it, it'd be the, all of the folks that you typically think of as, um, you know, coastal caucus people that have a relative interest in that. Yeah, we're targeting the uh, sixty to sixty-five, right, to extend that. Correct. Yeah. That should give us the most uneasiest gain. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are we, are we going to be moving to a story? Are you going to be presenting or is Commissioner Amadon going to be presenting item C? I'm going to be doing that, okay, Mr. Thanks. Chairman. Thanks, George. All right. So um, we've recently switched over to a new vendor for our mass fish hunt permitting system. And this has been a, a two year process to really modernize our mass fish hunt permitting, permitting system, which is not only used for saltwater uh, products, but also mass wildlife, freshwater fishing and hunting products. So um, the previous vendor, Aspira's contract, was set to expire on December 1st, 2021. So about two years ago, we started the process of looking for um, the next vendor, uh, whether it was Aspira or somebody else. And so as background, we had been with Aspira for 10 years. Um, they had really been the first vendor where um, all these permit sales came together. And of course, when the saltwater fishing permit first came into existence in 2011, they were the contractor. So uh, the two-year process started really in the fall of 2019. Um, 
with a request for information, basically seeking input from the industry as it existed then. So we wanted to hear about uh, the newest permit systems on the market and the capabilities they had. So we went through that process and that informed uh, kind of what we asked for and what we were looking for in the RFR for a new vendor. Um, so that process was ongoing through 2020 and 2021 to seek out who our next vendor would be. Um, and we ended up with eight or nine um, responses to that RFR that the procurement team um, weighed uh, and, and ranked based on the criteria that was set in the RFR. Um, and we ended up selecting Calcomai as our new vendor. And that project with them to, to build the new system began in March of 2021. Um, and one important note is, is part of the ranking were the customer transaction fees, because that is how this system is funded. It's how the vendor makes their money. And we ended up um, on this, with this new vendor, um, with fees that are roughly the same or actually less than with the previous vendors. So we were really pleased with that. Um, the administrative handling charge, which is a per product fee, went up slightly from $1.34 to $1.45, but the convenience fee on each internet transaction went down from 3% to 2%. So um, kind of by chance, the total transaction fee on a $10 saltwater fishing permit that a customer bought online is staying the same um, at $1.68. So, uh, and then if you, if you buy more than a $10 permit, the fees, the comparative fee is actually going down because that convenience fee is, is less at 2%. Uh, next slide. So some of the, the things that drew us to this new system um, are improved, um, um, an improved mobile experience for users, secure login with username and password that we didn't have before and we really needed now to be secure like any other uh, website where you're buying things linked accounts, um, for example, family members. Last week when the system went live, I, I linked to my wife's profile and now I can buy her permits, for example. And also auto renewal is a feature in this new system where a customer for a permit like saltwater fishing can choose to be auto renewed the following year and they'll get uh, several emails reminding them that that's coming up. They can opt out if they need to, uh, but it makes on auto renewal and, and renewal each year much easier. And we were also hoping for a more efficient staff uh, and vendor interface. And what we will also get um, is better analytics on who our customers are, kind of ease of looking at this data. And Christine's gonna follow me with a little more information on some of the improved features in that regard that we we do hope to see. Um, and one thing I want to mention is that the team for this was led by the department and it included DMF representatives and mass wildlife representatives working together uh, to come up with this solution. And the, the teamwork was really great led by the department. And I think because of that, we got a system that will work across both divisions and for the department. And I, I can't say enough about that team and how they work together on this. Uh, next slide. So the next slide is just a, a, a view of what the, um, the home page essentially for the system looks like where a customer would start um, and they would click get started. We, we won't go through the whole thing. Um, the good news is since it went live on, on December 1st, We've had about 400 permits issued, so it's working well. Um, but you can see here, um, there's plenty of information here before a customer even gets started. There's video tutorials on our, our, our pages that can walk customers through claiming their own account. There's a customer service number that the vendor Calcomai is manning to help customers. And we know that's been used. Um, DMF is in a, a little bit of a different position than mass wildlife because it's kind of our slow season for permitting so it's a bit of a soft launch for us where mass wildlife is in the the heart of hunting season 
of harvest reporting. So the system is getting a real active workout on the mass wildlife side. And um, all these resources are here though for customers. Next slide. So it go live um, last, last Wednesday or last Tuesday night in, into Wednesday, the Calcomite team was on site at the Mass Wildlife headquarters in Westboro, um, along with Dan Koch from the department and Mass Wildlife staff. And we were working directly with the vendor when the switch was flipped to the new system and then the following morning to fix minor issues as they came out. For example, uh, at check stations or in our offices um, as the activity ramped up Wednesday morning. And I would say that all that went really smoothly. There were little issues that could be fixed um, literally within 30 seconds with the vendor across from us. Um, and that was really impressive. And so I think that the, the transition went really well. Um, and again, it was, it was bigger for Mass Wildlife than it was for us because of what they had going on on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, but it seemed to go really well. Um, there were a few things that I wanted to make sure got worked out before we sent an email out to our listserv um, to, you know, to kind of alert them of the new system and go check it out and, and get your permit. But that email will go out today or tomorrow at the latest because those few little issues that we were waiting for, I think, have been sorted out. Um, but we continue to have uh, continued support from our vendor and they are available to fix little issues that come up this week to help vendors. They were going vendor to vendor doing training uh, and helping our staff. So that's in the short term. Um, and ongoing, um, more in the long term, this is a long term partnership between the department and Calcami. And there will be continuous product development through that partnership. So there were certain things we needed at go live. We needed to be able to issue a saltwater fishing permit, for example. But there's other things that will continue to be built over the next several weeks, months, and even years as this system matures. Um, Calcami also issues permits for the state of states of Nevada and New York. And any um, improvements that come out of those states will also benefit from if we want to, if we want those features. So um, we're happy with that partnership. And from a DMF perspective, it was a really successful rollout and the teamwork with the department and Mass Wildlife has been great. Um, and that's really what I have on kind of the nuts and bolts of the transition. And I'm happy to take any questions, but Christine also has a slide that she's gonna take on some of the additional functionality that this system will give us that we didn't have in the past that we're excited about. So I'll pause for a minute if there's any questions. Khalil, do you see hands or do you want me to call on people as they come I, I, I don't see any hand. I was looking for it and I don't, I don't, I don't see any hands. Uh, Commissioner uh, Amidon has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Ron. No problem, uh, Khalil. Uh, I just want to uh, comment a little bit on this. This process began over three years ago. Um, then General Counsel Rich Lee Han and I got together with Dan Coach, the Director of IT, and we put a tremendous amount of time and thought into exactly how to go about creating the team and to make sure that we had equal representation as far as partnership goes from both of the divisions as well as within the department and exactly who should sit on that team. And uh, I, can't, I can't compliment uh, Story and his side of the team enough for their input, the values, Kevin and, and all of his folks. Um, the process in which the request for information was set up to go out to even determine exactly how the request for pricing would be worded was meeting after meeting after meeting. Once all of that got done and they went into the process of selecting a, an actual vendor, then the real hard work began. And uh, 
fortunately and unfortunately, I was on the list of people that got shotgunned information out. So when the Q&A process started amongst the team members to do the analysis of how this process would go live, Every time someone wrote a question and every time someone provided an answer, it would ping my computer. I can tell you it drove me crazy. And I often thought about shutting it off. And Dan Coach told me there was a way to shut it off. But I kept it on there just to ensure that I understood the, the level of detail that these team members were going to to create a system that was going to work as close to flawless as possible. And I must say they damn near achieved that. So congrats to everybody on the team. Thank you. I didn't Thank realize you. you were getting all those notices, Ron. <laughs> so you saw it. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Are there any other comments or questions? Story, thank you so much for your, for your uh, report. No problem. There is one more slide we should let Christine go through because it's pretty interesting on the, the additional functionality. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, just really quick uh, to echo what Story and Ron have already said, um, Kim and I worked uh, almost a year with the event management group um, to work on um, the marketing and outreach piece and uh, working with Mass Wildlife and also Calchemy was wonderful. Um, Kim and I came into it um, really ready to learn and just take recommendations from Mass Wildlife since they had been uh, already managing the majority of their programs online. Um, and they were wonderful and really uh, helped us, you know, kind of understand uh, how to set everything up. And we're really excited to start using event management, but we won't be starting until about March. So I think the first events that will be going up are the ice fishing events. Um, so that'll be exciting to see. So a big part of this um, event management piece is that everything is integrated within Mass Fish Hunt now. And so we can um, specifically target and market to people based on age, location, uh, saltwater fishing status. Um, and then we can also manage on the inside all of our volunteers and our educators. So we're really excited. We think that this system is going to allow us to hyper target those individuals that would benefit from our programs. It's going to help us identify new program areas. Um, and then we can continue with follow-up. That's been a big piece that Kim and I have struggled with is uh, keeping in contact with people post uh, fishing clinics. So now, as you can see, just a couple of um, bullet points here. So from our end, we can um, run queries and find specific groups that we can target for marketing, but the students can as well. So now this new page allows you to search specific hunting and angler education programs based on your zip code, um, even the date range. So if you know you're going to be in Massachusetts for a vacation, we can even start marketing to people like that, age and event type. And then we also can now integrate Google Maps into these individual events so that people can download exact locations, which is a huge benefit, um, making sure that people are going to the right spot. Then we also can set our event size, automatic wait list, integrated release forms. So for those 16 and under, we can have all of our release and waivers in there. Um, so everything is managed then through the system. And then as we continue to grow our saltwater programs, we can then also offer our instructors admin permissions so that they can manage that, which does take some of the weight off of Kim and I specifically in having to manage each of these programs. So that would offer us the opportunity to grow and also add in some volunteers. Um, from that customer communication point, pre post class communication emails can be set up automatically. So similar to um, as Story mentioned, the reminder emails that your permit's going to be auto-renewed will have automatic reminders of any um, events that you're attending. Um, Post-event survey options, we've been doing this manually, so this is really big for us. Um, again, helps us to gather information on um, areas of improvement, what's working really well. And then 
the direct link from all of our social media channels um, directly to this registration is going to be really wonderful. So again, um, <clears throat> learning from everything that uh, Mass Wildlife has been doing for years and the different platforms that they've been using to manage their programs, which are a much higher scope, has really helped Kim and I hone in on what are the programs we're going to offer in 2022 to test this out. And we're really excited to see what the constituency you know, gives to us in a response on what's working, where else we can go. And um, it's going to be a lot smoother for all of us. Are there any and, questions? Uh, yep. All right, thank you, Christine. That was uh, great information. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Thanks again, Story. Thanks again, Christine. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move to item three, project updates. Uh, Mike Armstrong and Ross Kessler. OK. Um, we're going to briefly update you on some of the things um, that have gone on since uh, the main meeting. It's three of the four items are, are public access, and one is uh, diatronous. So the first one is uh, just Salem Willows and, and Ross way in at, at any time. Um, so this is a close up of what the pier looks like. Demolition apparently is imminent and um, we need to get it done before spring when some winter flounder closures and some other things come in. And that is the intent. And the city of Salem is paying for the demolition. Um, and you can see this, this pier is self-demolishing as we sit here. Um, so, Ross, anything to add? Um, the, 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 it has to start a little sooner than that uh, with a time of year restriction, um, but things should be moving this week. I did speak to Bill McHugh last week, um, and it's just uh, with all these projects, there's always some last minute things that, that set you back a week or two. Great. And do we have an estimate of when construction will begin? We, according to the engineer, should be done with planning and stuff like that by this summer. So I'm hoping the beginning of the fiscal year. I'm getting an unstable internet note too. So hopefully you guys are all hearing this. Yeah. All right. So anyway, the, the, the bottom line here is things are moving along actually pretty well in Salem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the city really, this, this is the focus point of the Salem Willows Park and uh, they really want to get it done. So it's a great project. Any questions? All right. Um, so the next, I think you've heard about some of them, but not all of them. These are three piers that are that are good and possible for us to fund. We haven't selected which one we're gonna to move to after Salem. Um, one of them at least, we may get funding maybe in a, a different direct way from legislation, that's possible. So what we wanna do is have a, a portfolio of projects where we have worked with the town, get the land use management agreement ready to go and if funding outside of our funding comes up, we can then hop on it because uh, Ross assures me he can work on more than one pier at once. Um, and if that doesn't arise, then we'll come to the panel when uh, we have the money to start a new pier. And so there's, there's one in Somerset. Uh, the one you haven't heard about is in Dighton. And uh, then we have a small pier in Fall River, which I, I think you've actually heard about before. Um, Ross, you want to add anything to that? I think that covers it pretty well. And this, uh, through at least one of these projects, will geographically fill out you know, our coastline pretty well with, with having a, a decent project, at least somewhere in every region, um, on a large project. We've had small projects pretty much everywhere. Yeah, okay, great. So I, I just wanted to update the, the panel on, on what sort of 
peer projects we're sitting on. Any questions? All right. Um, what we want to do is discuss with you guys uh, public access small grant program. As you know, we reserve $50,000 each year and we give it out as what we call small grants, which we cap at $15,000. We sometimes go a little bit more if we have it and they don't always ask for 15. But what we're seeing is a, is a problem, especially with costs of everything gone up so much. We suspect, uh, you know, staff beats the bushes trying to get projects every year. And it, it's been a little bit pulling teeth and even though sometimes we hand the town a project, they still don't move it forward. And we suspect part of the problem is 15 grand is just not worth the trouble for some of these towns to, to pursue. There is some paperwork, not a ton. And 15 grand doesn't really go very far anymore. So um, we haven't made any decision, but we'd like to discuss it with you. Um, should we go a different direction? maybe just mind changing in minor ways. So the current max is 15 grand to a town. Um, as I said, there seems to be a lack of interest to pursue these grants. Um, so the question is, should we increase the maximum amount of the grant? 20,000, 25, 30,000, I don't know. If so, do we reduce the number of grants so that we remain in the same amount of money overall? Or do we increase the grant program? For instance, um, you know, make it a uh, $25,000 max and have three grants. So we'd have to bump up 75,000 a year. And it would be, we'd be moving money around a little bit. And, you know, it's in that pool of public access. So it's doable. Um, Ross, you want to add anything to that before we open it up for discussion? Well, the, the one thing I find that's problematic of anything, and, and it could relate to a larger project as well, is that we try and close these out within the same fiscal year. And it would, it would be more work on our part, sort of figuring out exactly how much we can budget per year. And maybe expanding it to a two-year contract, um, which is, is very common with a lot of the construction things we do, especially when you bring permitting in. Um, sometimes I'll tell a town, hey, this is great, but you have to do all the permitting work before we can even think about it. And one town, Truro, did that uh, at Pamet a few years ago, and they came back and said, hey, we got the permitting done. Can we apply this year? I said, by all means, please do. And they did. And it was it turned out to be a really good project. If we could go into this with a two-year um, time frame, I think it would be much easier for towns as well or any entity that wants to apply through us. I mean, we also do uh, accept projects from NGOs as long as they're, uh, the towns that they're in are, are, are amenable to it. So, I, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's, I forgot to put that on the slide. Making it two year would be helpful too. Um, so I think what we'll do, we'll take any of your comments now. Um, we'll keep talking about it in-house and, and getting your comments. And then we'll come back in the spring um, and probably have a proposal maybe to change it somewhat. So do any of the um, panelists have any comments about this program and where we should go with it? I don't see any hands, uh, Mike. Um, maybe maybe the, the way to do it is to, uh, as you say, uh, Bring, bring us proposals back for a spring meeting and uh, then and maybe um, educate us as, as you as we approach that meeting as to what you might be presenting and then I do see a hand up I'll get to that person in a second um, and then uh, maybe uh, react or talk about it then uh, Patrick Patrick you yeah. had your hand up yep yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thanks, Mike, and everybody, um, and Ross, for the uh, presentation and information. Um, just responding to your uh, request for comments, um, I, I, um, I, I, I'd like to see uh, what you guys are talking about putting together. 
Uh, my only immediate thought was that uh, in my head, this program was the, or is the piece of the overall, um, of the overall um, funding management that is um, sort of what that was built to be the maintenance and preserve access kind of thing. Um, when we went into this originally, it was how are we going to do stuff like, you know, prevent loss of access because somebody couldn't maintain it. And how are we going to um, like have a pot of money to save, to save access places that, town, you know, that the, the towns are neglecting, et cetera. And um, my only initial thought as you were doing the presentation was, yeah, that's cool to raise it up and try and do more. Um, I just want to make sure that we don't lose the ability to um, to have something available to be protecting access from a maintenance point of view. Um, that's all that I just don't want to, I don't want to change a program that it gets away from that. Okay, thank you, Patrick. That's, yeah, it wouldn't be our intent to, to change the goal of this, just to make it more attractive to towns, I think is, is our goal. And we do, we are working on it, maybe a new letter and um, pieces for the RFR to, to broaden at least to the public so they know that we're, we're willing to fund a, a diverse amount of things. We tend to get the same thing over and over again, you know, a little canoe ramp, um, things like that. Um, so we're gonna start beating the bush a little differently to try and get more diverse projects. Hey. Um, sorry, Mike or Ross, can I just, uh, Mr. Chairman, Khalil, can I just ask one follow-up? Yes, yes, you may. Hey, Ross, re um, regarding the, um, the what qualifies and doesn't qualify, I wanted to throw one at you. If a, um, if a town or a, um, or a, or a beach management entity um, was looking at participating in the habitat in the statewide habitat HCP habitat conservation permit program. Um, that one of the benefits of using that program is to open up access to alternative ways around plovers and whatnot to maintain public access. Is that the kind of thing that, like, because I know it's roughly ten thousand um, a um, an episode, um, is that the kind of thing that could a beach manager apply to cover their 10K through this money? Uh, I would say yes, with a caveat. Um, and by the way, I was involved with uh, the formation of the HCP. I worked with Scott. He brought me into that, as I think you're probably aware. Anyhow, uh, I think that would be a very good use. The only caveat would be that there has to be equitable access there uh, I had a not a not a plover situation or, or, or a similar situation like that this year with an application for a uh, small grant and it was limited to either the people of West Island or the people of West Island and Fairhaven I said we're, we're, we just can't fund that we have to open it up to everybody so until the town changes their rules um the HCP, you know, so in, in the short answer is yes, the HCP um, or funding some aspect of it would be a, certainly a good use uh, of that money. Um, and then just to um, make you more confident that we've not lost sight of the mission of the small grant um, project, I can't really divulge who the three winners were for this fiscal year yet because the governor uh, is the person who announces them, not our agency. But uh, one of them, was a uh, access for all persons uh, in Buzzards Bay in an area that's being refurbished. Uh, another one was a, a town that has two landings and both of those are gonna be made to be safer and, and better access points for all persons. And I, there is good parking and et cetera there for all persons. And the last one, um, I guess I'll give it away a little bit, will aid you next year when you're doing a lot of your car stuff with the, um, uh, the, the Derby over on the vineyard. One of the, one of the towns there applied for something to make the make it a safer place to get in and out of. So we have not lost sight of that mission. 
Excellent. Um, no, thank you very much. And yeah, no, we're, I, I appreciate the caution about the public access openness and the, and the responses by both Mike and um, Ian Ross regarding the um, intention. I, I did not want to be, I'm not throwing any shade at this at all. I just want to make sure that we, as we expand on the top end, that we, that we maintain that bottom end so that, so that that money is available for this little stuff. But thank you very much. Right. And, and, and that's the challenge. I think Patrick is we, we want to keep the sort of the feel of the program. Um, but we have it's been in for what, 11, 12 years. And so that 15 K is it's been eroded quite a bit by uh, inflation. So, I mean, this is, the, I'm two sorry. Year, the two year piece that Ross talked about makes all kind of sense to me as somebody who works with some agent with some towns um on occasion of regarding access stuff um that that two-year thing I, I i that would probably help everybody yeah that and i mean we're probably looking at 25 or 30 30 grand um will be our proposal and it is you know it's been a big success um and it's also very visible for us it's a very visible use of the fund and because the, they are impactful projects, small in scope, but also get done very quickly. And the town's generally appreciative. So it's a good program. We, we're just gonna gussy it up a little to make it more attractive. So any, any more comments or questions? I see no hands, Mike. All right, then I'll move on to the final uh, thing I'd like to update you on and get your opinions on. Let me get this screen to move. Um, so we've been, this, so this would be part of the diatomous program that, that we already fund. Um, so I'm proposing to start a new project. We've been working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, in the North Attleboro Hatchery and they have a capability now of hatching shad. Now, stepping back, using the model that we used in the Charles River, we successfully brought shad back, and that was from the Nashua hatchery, I think. We stocked for five years. Um, we marked their otoliths with tetracycline, and then we sampled in three or four and five years when they would come back, and lo and behold, when we looked at their otoliths, uh, a fair amount of them actually were our fish. So it worked. The problem is we have not been able to get DCR to take out the Watertown Dam. And that continues to be a real barrier for um, successful restoration. And then going up the river in six, seven miles, you're going to hit another big dam. So it's a good river and it would have been a pretty good River without the Watertown Dam. Um, so we've moved on from that. You know, there's a residual population, some of it from our stocking, and that'll, there's actually a fairly, uh, uh, like a good recreational uh, fishery that goes on below the dam. So we'll move on to a better river, which is the Taunton, which is our largest undammed river. It's almost the only undammed river in the coastal uh, Massachusetts. Now, a lot of its tributaries are, are dammed, but these are main stem spawners and there's lots of good habitat. There was a habitat survey a number of years ago that looks like very inviting spots. And for whatever reason, they have not recolonized, but that's not unusual. They have a fair amount of homing to their natal streams. And so it's hard to get them to recolonize. So what we would do is, we would stock, uh, I can't remember what the proposal is, two, three, four, five million um, larvae in the upper Taunton in the appropriate habitats. Do that for uh, five years and mark them with tetracycline and then monitor through young of year surveys and through uh, electrofishing for adults. And I, I'm pretty sure we could be successful and if we do, it'll be a heck of a recreational fishery. So it'd be great. Um, now, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they need some, some money to help them along. 
um, and we actually beat them down a little bit, but so they need 30 grand a year. So times five years, at least five years, that's about 150,000. So 30,000, I can't say I have it right now in the fund, but I think we can move money around and, and successfully uh, do this because 30,000 isn't that much money. Um, so I will come with a firm proposal in, in May and we'd actually start doing this um, in June hatchery work next year if, if we move it forward. So any comments, uh, opinions on us uh, starting this project up? And, and it, let me be clear that no, there's no more staff time. I'm not asking for money for staff or anything. We will use current staff and redirect some of their efforts um, to do this. And, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife does a lot of the work too. So any questions or opinions? Any, uh, I see Mike Piardnock. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, were, were the shad larvae are proposed to be placed, is that all the way up in Bridgewater? Do they know exactly where that area is? Is it downtown Taunton or how far up would you go? Uh, I don't think Brad is on, he, he would, I don't know the specific location, Mike, but we have- Hi, had... Mike, I, I am on here, Mike. Oh, okay, Brad, sorry. Yeah, go, go yeah no problem. Let me just go ahead quickly and say that uh, we did five years of same sampling and electro fishing in the Taunton, and we did collect juvenile shad as well as a single adult shad. So we know there are some there and we would target the upper third of where we sampled which would be, you know, downtown Taunton area and further upstream. Uh, thank you, Brad. I mean, that's a very productive uh, river uh, as uh, when you get farther down by Dighton. I, I, I go in there with my boat and uh, the fish or, or waterfowl that you see on that river is amazing, uh, even as you go down to Taunton, but even as you go farther up into Bridgewater. So I was just curious. This, this looks uh, positive, um, you know, hopefully it'll move forward. Thank you. Commissioner Amidon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would just want to uh, congratulate Mike and, and Brad on this work, this investigation into the, the Taunton River. I think this is an excellent idea. I think um, your shift of focus towards that river is, is very appropriate for this particular time. Um, what you may not know is I have been working on the Charles River Watertown Dam situation for approximately two years now. And um, I can tell you that the interest in that project is beginning to shift. And I think the timing that you're talking about here for this particular study is perfect. As about the time that you begin to wrap this up, you may want to consider refocusing on the Charles River again in five years. That sounds great, Ron. Yeah, we, we can definitely plan on doing that. Thank you, Commissioner. Panel member Kevin Blinkoff. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just was wondering if this same program, um, you know, obviously the Charles River is a model is this going on or has it found success in other rivers in the Northeast? Yes, um, there's been various stocking efforts. Uh, I'm trying to think of, and Brad maybe can help me out. I know the Susquehanna, they have done extensive e efforts to bring this them back. Um, any failures or, or partial things they've managed to accomplish because there's dams with lousy passage. So we're excited about this one because the Taunton River does not have dams, at least the main stem. And that's, that's crazy. The, the only other river that's like that would be the Neponset. And unfortunately, there's two dams down towards the estuary that are very contaminated and very contentious. So I, I know Brad worked for years to try and get some leverage in the Neponset. So we'll, we'll keep looking at that, but for now, 
Um, we have the ton and it's very close to the hatchery. So it's ideal. I, I think it's going to work and it'll be a tremendous fishery like we have in the Merrimack. The shad fishery in the Merrimack is really, really popular. Thank you. I Panel think, member I Patrick Paquette. In, uh, or not. It, it has been used. Brad, do you know other places with larval stocking? It's actually been done a lot on the East Coast. And the Susquehanna River is probably the, the one place people talk about the most because they had great success early on, which leveled off some. It might have been related to the, the dams that still remain, but it has been used a fair amount. I think one feature to this that we're hoping to do this time is to use genetic marking and maybe move away from the tetracycline sampling, which requires lethal subsampling. So that may be one new feature that is going to be looked at to mark these fish by their genetic stock, which would be the Connecticut River. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Mike. Sure. It, it, just an aside, um, Chad is still struggling, American Chad, and it's mostly because they've been extirpated by um, dams primarily. And so they're still considered sort of uh, not doing well on the whole coast. And the Taunton, they were probably extirpated by somewhat overfishing, but probably because the Taunton was a dirty, dirty river for a long time because of industry. And that wiped out a lot of stuff. So it's much, it's much cleaner. It's designated as a, what do they call it? A scenic river, or it's got some designation um wild and scenic wild and scenic so thank you so it's a nice river now and i think i think this will work patrick you had your hand up yep and um, thank thank you Julio. um i just wanted to um express support um for for what we're talking about here um i think that it's the program is um fits um, all, all the, you know, all the check boxes in my head. Um, I did want to comment that I do hope that when, um, cause the first thing you think about is, or at least that I think about as a panel member is, can we afford it? And is there a trade-off? And it sounds like Mike is saying, um, moving some stuff around our, um, traditional budget that that's been formulated here is, is what's going to happen. Um, I just hope that we have some input in seeing what that's going to look like. Um, that being said, um, I'm absolutely supportive of this going forward. Um, and to Mr. Amadon, I will only say to you um, that the whole the whole dam removal thing um, is another one of those uh, pockets of interest of mine personally. Um, I served I served on that committee that citizens committee for the legis for the massachusetts legislature that worked on the one um in the neponset river <laughs> that um is to this day had a plan without um without moving forward and um the last thing i wanted to um tell uh, mr amadon was that the one place i care about more than martha's vineyard and boston harbor together is the charles river um that's where i learned to fish and <laughs> Um, what I consider to be my, that's my ashes will be scattered at a place not far from the, from the dam you're talking about. So any help you need regarding that Watertown dam removal, and hopefully it goes all the way up to the big falls and Walt dam too. Um, just call me and use me like a slave. Uh, <laughs> be careful what you wish for, Patrick. I may do that. I do have a very I'm, good team working on it right now. I'm not... I'm not, I'm not kidding one little bit. No. I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any more comments, questions? Thanks so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Russ, thank you. Let's move on to the final item. And uh, that's panel member discussion items. And we, uh, there are two items. One is gonna be by Mike Moss regarding Cape Cod Canal access. The second is going to be a question that uh, Patrick has uh, has asked, and hopefully we'll get some clarification today. And we each each of us have received uh, the documents that are going to be discussed today. So hopefully you 
had a chance to, to read them in advance of this meeting. And so I'd like to keep this, you know, to the point, concise, and, and to have some discussion and to see where this is going to lead us. So, uh, Mike Moss, I'm going to recognize you now uh, for the document that you sent us regarding the proposal for um, handicap access on the on the Cape Cod Canal. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. All right, well, at the beginning of the license uh, proposal, we didn't start off with any more access. And once we got that on the table, we started gaining some interest. And this is where all of us are involved today because of that success in getting the license fee portion out of it for access. And my part of it for many years and from, from the beginning was to be sure that, well, I call it the poor people's access, but people who can just go fishing and be able to go fishing. And we're looking to extend uh, the license fee a little bit from what it is. And that would also still accommodate them people who's trying to fish. Uh, the canal, of course, is a great uh, fish way. And I have a lot of that I put together. I looked at all these spots with uh, Ross Kessler. And I've looked at them many times and fished them many times because we're located right close to the canal to which the surf casting club. Uh, anyway, these uh, these places, I'll read off the letter that we uh, prepared. Uh, Ross looked at the places with me. He feels that they're usable cheaply. The one in the title flats, of course, one time was owned by the founder of the uh, Worcester Surf Gasoline Club, Johnny Williams, is our number one member, first one on the charter. And he wanted to, uh, many years ago, put a small marina there on his property, but they never allowed him to do it. So then, but that land is still there, and there's also parking available, a couple of ways to get to it. So it would make it more accessible to people trying to fish. The Cape Cod Canal is one of the most iconic shore fishing locations for striped bass in the world. Anyway, before I continue further, you could call out the Moss Cross intervention. When the migration is discussed, names like Montauk, Race Point, Cape May, Seaside Park and the canal always lead to discussion. The Cape is arguably the most accessible big fish location of all these places. Anyone with a car or fishing rod can freely fly the water of this human created fish highway. I wonder if anyone thought that would happen. Anyone who is physically able to navigate the riprap and the slippery boulders, that is. For those who have aged and become physically incapacitated, I think that's me. And Cape Cod Canal access is limited to the DCR managed scusser fish pier. To a lesser extent, the seawall abutting the canal visited center next to the Sandwich Marina. The members of the Marine Development Panel, speaking on behalf of them, would like to propose the Division of Marine Fisheries pursuing the installation of a number of small fishing piers like structures on both sides of the canal that would provide access to elderly, youth, physically disabled, especially those that were disabled and part of the military defending our great nation. These small peer like peer structures can easily be designed and placed geographically near existing access points along the length of the canal. After a simple driving tour, the following locations have all the needed characteristics, including ample parking, minimal slope, and short distance to the water's edge that would provide a great opportunity to anglers who are able to navigate the Cape Cod Canal Rock line, Rocky Shoreline. The areas that we've talked about and looked at is the Tidal Flats Recreation Area on Bell Road. Everyone knows where that is, the railroad bridge. Everyone who gets in the area looks there. 
and it would enhance the fishing for people that are a little bit handicapped. The museum at Apatuxet, there's plenty parking there now, and there's an easy extension of that parking. It's almost the parking area is just about done for what you need. Bourne Recreation at Cape Cod Canal under the Bourne Bridge on the Cape side. Excellent place. Parking is also pretty well available. The Army Corps of Engineers Visitor Center, already accessible, could be made better. Sagamore Recreation Area next to the Sagamore Bridge mainland side and the Heron Run up by, I think it's called 175, is kind of one of the deep spots up there. Uh, would be a good area. There, there's parking there already, plenty. Those six new locations seem overwhelming. The planning and design could be reused at each location. Some further engineering would be needed for each location as well. The access structures could be built over time. Every one of us will sometime be unable to climb down the rocks to fish the canal. The access component of the saltwater fishing permit was approved with the above proposal projects in mind. Please consider approaching the American Corps of Engineers to begin the work that's needed to be done to make this possible proposal a reality. Excuse my stuttering. I think that's really when we started out with this license fee and getting the access money is one of our attentions. We made some big projects, expensive projects like on the island, Deer Island and Martha's Vineyard and on and on as they go. Some improvements, some completely rebuilds or new. They all serve a purpose, but this would serve more people in small areas. And I hope that uh, we all get behind this and move forward on it now. Ross has spent a lot of time looking at it and making sure that it made sense. And as he says, uh, the design can be the same for all of them, just an adjustment to make them fit. More or less a pier with a little different bracket to hook it to the rocks. They know how that's done. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you all come and support this. Thank you, Mike, very much. Uh, very, very informative, uh, very compelling. Uh, since I had a had a family member who was physically handicapped, I can and uh, also as we get a little older, I can understand, um, you know, where you're coming from regarding this uh, proposal or proposals. Uh, as we are, get there any, are there any are there any comments from or, or questions or thoughts from either the panelists or from um, DMS. Um, can I chime in just a little bit? Who says? This is Ross. I'm sorry. Ross, yes, please. Um, so this is something that I have uh, brought up before at the May 20th uh, meeting of, of this year. I mentioned in, in uh, my public access presentation that this is something that Mike has been uh, lobbying for, for for quite some time now. And in addition to that, I did reach out to John McPherson in August of 2019, uh, just to at least you know begin the, the the conversation. And due to budgeting shortfalls and time and everything else, it's sort of fallen by the wayside. Um, so I don't want anyone to think that we're starting from square one here necessarily. Although we're we're pretty close to square one. I mean, it's a concept at this point. Um, but it would be it would be really neat if we could do this. Uh, one thing that John did point out that these federal and state um, partnerships are sometimes difficult, at least at the beginning. So um, if this is something that we want to um, follow up on or, or start moving forward with, I have a feeling it's gonna take some time to get done. And uh, now is always the best time to start. Thank you. Any other comments or thoughts? So, so Ross, let me, let me, let's go back. So, where where would we, where would we go from here? How 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 do you see this possibly proceeding? If if this the con, is something the, con, the concept, the concept issue part of it, and bringing it into, uh, you know, working it down the line. Well, I mean, I, I think what, what Mike and I were talking about, and I think we're both on the same page. And anyone I've discussed this with, we're talking about small platforms that are built into the riprap. That would be something that we need to form a partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers with on, 
And then it would be, you know, who's paying for what, what do they look like? Um, you know, we, we probably also have all these uh, six locations that we've spelled out all uh, meet the, the standard of having parking and distance from parking from people who are, you know, not able to hop on a bike or, or walk a mile, let's just say. And uh, once we... Lost you. Lost you, Russ. I look at almost not unlike the um, artificial reef program. Uh, the first time we did that deployment, we just had some money that we sort of needed to spend at the time. And that paid for the deployment end of things. Um, not that we have a whole lot of spare money sitting around, but with the increases in costs and just the way that um, opportunity presents itself when projects get pulled away or, or, or you know, just happenstance tends to lend itself towards a good opportunity and time coinciding. I hope that answers the question. It, it did, and I think it, I think it's I think this project's worthy of, of looking into. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a concept that might lead to some reality or some plan, some some plans down the line. And um, and it may not be everything that's done all at once, uh, but it's going to be in you know in baby steps along the way. So um, I, we we look forward to just you know learning more as to how we may be able to bring this concept into some kind of reality. And I think it's, this is gonna be something that's gonna be worked on down the line and that we're not gonna make any decisions today. But, um, but, but Mike Moss, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention and for your thoughts. Let's hope we move forward with it soon. Uh, Patrick, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to, um, one, uh, express some support for the concept. And um, um, I, 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 I think that when I look at the, the long term, um, I'm assuming that this is, we're talking about, this falls under sort of the major projects um, uh, list. And um, where, it's not, where it sounds like we're, like we're, we're looking at what passed that the next, the Southeastern Mass Pier, it seems to be after Salem Willows that like, that like that that's the time frame maybe that this possibly could fit into. Um, I mostly, well, I also wanted to, beside expressing support for going down the road of talking about it, um, I wanted to make two other comments. One is that I know that, I know that um, from, both work down at um, at the Cape Hatteras National Seashore regarding some um, some of the um, access jetties that were built um, around the same time as the canal expansion on the Sagamore Edge and the way the riprap was that um, even putting like a couple of pylons around the base of some of those riprap become permitting nightmares um, from an engineering point of view. And secondly, um, so I want to be, to advance this idea properly so that it has some success, I think there's a bunch of pre-footwork that has to be done. Um, but one of the pieces right now that's more immediate is that there is in that federal infrastructure package, um, every single um, entity, um, government agency, federal agency in the country that deals with recreation um, has access to a pot of money. It was just discussed, I believe. Mike Piernock, Piernock can probably remember, they were just talking about this as the, um, as the um, what is it? It's not build back better it's something but that there's a there's a pot of federal money about bringing american recreation um, or restoring american recreation that is available right now and the army corps of engineers has the ability to get at that money um and there's some fed we have some federal people in fisheries um that know about that stuff because it's getting passed around um the information so I, there's um, from the from the from the funding point of view, there may be an opportunity sooner rather than later for one of these for this type of project um, to actually get funded in house too, um, which I know when the money is 
in the federal system, it's a little bit easier. But I just wanted to flag that that I think there's I think there's some funding opportunity that's maybe even quicker than we can move, but that's out there. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to also uh, mention that I support this uh, as a concept. Um, what Patrick just mentioned, if this could happen sooner than later with federal money, that's that's interesting. But um, I also had a question that was brought to me in the past week by someone who was thinking a little longer term, if there's changes to the bridges, if there's bridge construction, and I don't know when that would actually happen, is there any chance there would be an opportunity to kind of use that structure to create an access site? Has anybody looked at that? And this was somebody who brought it up and talked about how um, when bridges are, are taken down in uh, Florida, use that as an example, that the structure that's left behind was converted into fishing access. Um, we've, we've explored that in the past with certain bridges and typically the cost associated with maintaining those types of structures is, is extraordinarily high. And that's sort of the reason why the Somerset project is not on the old uh, Brightman Street Bridge, I guess it is. Um, and if you look at that structure, I mean, the, the maintenance of it is, is <laughs> would be like the entire marine fisheries budget every time you needed to do anything to it. So that's why we're proposing something smaller um, currently there. Um, but yeah, there, there's also the idea of being able to build on to uh, existing projects to get them to fund other things. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds with this, but I think we could also ask the uh, Army Corps or maybe even lead in a way with the Army Corps to say, hey, you know, we've got money for this and we're willing to move forward with it. We just haven't taken it to a point of getting an uh, getting approval from the rec panel and you know, our whole, our inner group, and then getting a contract with the Army Corps. And that's when the, when the real work of planning begins. It's kind of what I figured, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Any more questions or thoughts? Uh, Michael? You Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mike uh, Moss. Uh, I like the concept. Uh, well done. Um, hopefully this can move forward. Uh, I, I agree with uh, any way we can facilitate this to have funding through the feds uh, and the, at the canal uh, or elsewhere. The, now's the time to, to look at that. Uh, my question, uh, in addition to that, is what is the next step then? Do, does DMF then look at the feasibility of this or reach out? I, I'm just trying to get an understanding conceptually, since we're all positive about this or on board, what, what would be the next step? Thank you. My feeling would be approaching the Army Corps of Engineers and getting an agreement with them not uh, dissimilar to the land management agreement that we use with the, uh, from Office of Fishing and Boating Access. But, you know, I mean, we may have to call it something different because it's a federal entity. I don't, I don't really know how that all works, but the, the, the concept is the same. It's, it's an agreement between any number of parties to move forward with a project and then distribution of costs and responsibilities. And Mr. Chairman, I have one last question if- By all means. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and Ross, uh, with that, then, would you come back to the panel or, or what's the timing? Is this a month away, several months away? Just it's to have an understanding. Open -ended of that at this point. I mean, we really haven't got, taken the next step or, or we, don't, we also don't have approval to, to, I don't have approval to go forward meeting with anybody. And I, I so. I see. So very preliminary at this point. So I, yes. I guess we'll sit tight and see where we go from there. Thank you. Mike Moss. Mike. Mike, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. This is a good project for the PR of it. It tells the public what we're actually doing and it's very visible. And that should be any agency that side comes in with us to give them exposure to of what's going on. First thing they ask is, what do you do with the license money? Well, you can see this in six different places very easily where a lot of people fish. A lot of benefit to them. And thanks for listening to our opinion. 
Thank all who helped. Thank you, Mike. Dave Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I Thank weigh you. in? Dave? Uh, yeah, real quick, I just wanted to mention in regards to the Brighton Street Bridge discussion earlier between Ross and Kevin, um, folks are not allowed to fish from the old bridge that's there in existence, which is different from like in Florida, you see some of those old bridges, people can still fish from them. But in Brighton Street Bridge, that's all blocked off and, and fishing is not allowed there. Um, you used to be able to fish there when you know the bridge um, was in existence and cars were going over it and it was a very popular spot to fish but that has since been eliminated with the construction of the new bridge and the decommissioning of the old bridge thanks thank you mike for that information are there any further comments or questions yes mr chairman yes um i think next steps right now also include, um, I think we, we start some informal discussions with the core. And I also think we need to take this list and see if we can prioritize it. Because I, I, unless there's a, a lot of money sitting somewhere with the feds, I don't see us doing these all at once. And I don't know if these are all as equally desirable, but my suspicion is some are better than others. And then I think we need a conceptual uh, like back of the envelope um, working with Doug Cameron because I don't have any idea what this looks like in concept or how much we're talking about. I don't know if we're 500,000 or for a million dollars for each one of these. Um, I don't know if it's six feet long where you can fish from or if we're talking 20. So I think we need to flesh out exactly what, what we're talking about. Uh, Mike Moss, do you... Do you have a, a vision in your head of what it would look like? I have a vision. I don't, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I have a vision, but I don't have a dimension. If you're saying how long and how big, I was kind of leaving that up to the experts of where it would uh, get an association to the, the actual place. Yeah. I, as was Rock said, the theorized that if you made one just for a figure 100 feet long, they'd all be 100 feet long and they'd all be visibly look the same. We also talked a little bit about a place where you could drag a fish up over the rocks without so much obstruction, maybe a concrete slide or something. And of course, it needs to be wide enough for wheelchairs for people to get around and then let other people fish. Uh, it needs to be built for all, and the planning, I think, would be like uh, uh, Doug Cameron's crew and uh, I think Terry Smith draws some of them things up if he's still with them. Something like Jack did it for us many years. But that's that's about all I can suggest. There, I, I don't, you know, it don't need to be a deer island. It needs to be something just to gain some access to different places. And get people on that's got now time to fish but not the ability well thank you mike that uh you know i think we're all in agreement that this is a great concept and uh, mike armstrong you came up with uh great ideas about you know your thoughts about how we might be able to proceed with this and i i just feel that we just need to you know ross uh working with mike and and and, and seeing if we can develop some kind of a plan and it's going to be baby steps, obviously, because it's just not going to happen overnight. And um, so I look forward to, I think we all look forward to uh, seeing this thing um, develop over the, over the. Well, if, it was, if the plan was devised, it could be brought to the panel sooner than later. Right. We could do something in between meetings and, and we could have something to digest and support or add to or take from. In the meantime, rather than waiting to uh, till May, it's another six months, and something could be started. Exactly what I know. the planning of the size of it, I suppose. I understand. I understand your concerns, Mike, and your your thoughts behind what you're saying. Um, I think what we do is we need to uh, the, the, the the division has heard what you had to say and your concerns and how you want to proceed. 
I just think we need to come up with a plan. And um, I'm going to leave that up to Russ and to, we'll leave that up to Russ, not me, but we'll leave that up to Russ and, up to Russ. And, and, Mike, and Mike to, to, to deal with this and, and, and come up and maybe report back to us. You got the two best people on it. Keep them there. Yes, but we have to, we're, we're beginning at the beginning. We're, uh, it's, it's going to be small steps and it, it may not happen overnight and, and as fast as you might want. But, um, but I feel, we all feel it's a great idea. And I just, we just need to begin the pathway towards, you know, what we want to do. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, before we leave, before we leave project updates, I, uh, um, Mike Armstrong, I, and I spoke to you a little bit about it. Uh, I'd like to just say that regarding the Deer Island dedication that occurred on June 24th, I attended that as did uh, several other panel members. And I, I just need to say it was a wonderful day, a wonderful event. Uh, it really showed what teamwork uh, can do to get a project like this accomplished. Patrick Paquette, Paquette uh, he, he, he gave us a, he was one of the speakers that, at the keynote speakers at that, at that dedication representing the panel members. He did a superb job. Uh, he gave us a history uh, of, of his youth and how he saw this whole thing develop and, and his input when he was chairman of the, of the panel uh, uh, several years ago. And so um, I just wanted to just congratulate everyone for that wonderful day. It was really incredible. I don't know if any other panel members who were there want to speak. Uh, and also, Mike, I don't know if you want to say anything. Mike, uh, Mike Armstrong. I, um, or, or, excuse me, or let me, let me back up, or Russ, because Russ was a key player in this. Yeah, I, I couldn't attend the festivities, I'm afraid. So I'll defer and, uh, to Russ, or our director may want to, uh, Dan may want to say a few words too. I'll defer to Dan. It was, <clears throat> it was good to see the project done and people able to use it is all I, I want to say. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I was um, in federal court that day, so I was also uh, unable to attend. Um, we did create that video uh, to try to create some legacy for the event and also uh, as kind of a calling card for future projects like this one that maybe we could get um, you know, more attention from legislators and, and others. But um, I understand it was, it was a great event and I, I, I wanna thank Patrick for, for uh, coming through the 11th hour and, and agreeing to be uh, the key speaker because um, and, and, he was obviously involved with this early on and uh, you know, coming from that, from those, that urban environment uh, and, and being a, an angler, he was, um, I'm sure it was great, so. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else that I want to add at this time. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, I thought it was a superb day and um, I was very pleased to be able to be there to, to witness it. All right, we're going to move on to our last item on the agenda. And uh, I, I had a chance, this has uh, been brought forth by, by Patrick Paquette and Paquette and um, and I spoke to him about this, about the, about this, and I also spoke to Mike Armstrong about it. It's not more of a proposal, but it's more of a question that Patrick is raising. And uh, Patrick, would you like to take it, take it from here uh, to talk about your concerns and your questions regarding support for law enforcement uh, from the panel? Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Khalil. Thank you. Um, so um, let me be clear. Um, so my view is when we get appointed to this is, um, my understanding is we're appointed as individuals, um, um, and we're supposed to bring, um, some sort of our, you know, our experience and our expertise coming from the community. Um, in the world I live in, if you spend more than five minutes talking about this license, someone brings up enforcement. Um, the, the cry for enforcement at the street level with fishermen right now regarding multiple species, primarily striped bass, but the whole 
black sea bass, um, true dog issues. Um, enforcement comes up all the time. Um, for years, I've had a pat answer. For years, I have said back that, hey, I remember discussions about this early on and one getting money to that particular corner of the state police is not budget so that it was used for marine resources only. So sort of dedicating money like that is, my understanding is it's not possible. Um, I've got two individuals um, who I see through two different organizations. One is former state police law enforcement and the other one is formal state official. And they're both telling me that my answer is wrong and that it is possible. Um, I'm not even saying that I know that it's an appropriate use of the fund, but I hear it too many times in a year. And when I say too many times, a lot, 30, 40, 50 um, times do I hear or read uh, people's interest in supporting or targeted enforcement. As a matter of fact, kudos to whomever wrote it on the agenda because they already said it better than I could as far as staff. Um, so my question, because the one thing I feel is, there, is somebody responsible, I have no problem telling somebody I disagree or that something is too complicated or too expensive. Um, and that when that kind of decision gets made by DMF or it comes from a recommendation from this panel. Um, but the one thing that I can't do is look at um, members of the Commonwealth and give them an opinion and hear them tell me that my base of information is incorrect. Um, and so I guess the reason I brought this up is because I would like to know if it's possible, whether that be internal state accounting or um, and under the, legisl the legislation itself, is it possible that um, funding from this license can be used to support um, Law, enfor uh, law enforcement, especially in these, like what I'll call high value um, situations. Um, is, is there a possibility? That's where I think it starts. Um, and again, I have personally, I'll just sh share this with the committee. I have more personal reasons to be against something like this than for it. And I've made, as I speak to people in the public, I say the same thing. Um, that being said, um, to not consider something that clearly has a lot of overwhelming um, interest by the community who buys the license. Um, I just personally, I find it that there's a responsibility for me, at least as a member, to bring it up and ask some questions about it. And that's what I'm mostly doing here is seeking information. So to find out what's possible, not possible um, before uh, uh, so that those conversations and, and, and feeling like I fulfill the responsibility as being a member of this panel. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Mike and I, Mike Armstrong and I uh, have had a chance to talk about this a little bit. Mike, do you want to shed some light on Patrick's thoughts and concerns? Sure. Um, so the basic question, you were told, yes, we could transfer money within the state. That is absolutely true, as far as I know. If we want to lose all our wallet row money, we can absolutely go ahead and do that. That's the problem. Um, there are rules, and I'll check and double check, and maybe I'll bring them to the next meeting. Sorry. As you know, we reimburse against the wallet row money. We get federal money back for what we spend. Under that rule, you cannot spend money on enforcement. If you do, it's not reimbursable. And further, it has to be documented that it was spent only on enforcement for recreational measures. That's a difficult bar for the environmental police to do. We are audited every two years by Fish and Wildlife Service and there are findings. We make mistakes. They find, oh, you, use, you, know, you put the salary in the wrong this and that. So they will come in and they will look and make sure that money, any money we give to the environmental police was used for in, um, recreation enforcement. And I, I don't know if they can actually do that. Um, so yes, physically that we could, 
send money to them. The, the things against that are, we don't bring in that much money. We only bring in $1.4 million. The environmental police budget is 12, 13, 14 million or something like that. Um, and the other thing is we would have to think about going against the panel and Patrick was there. We, we took 20, I don't know, 25 people from all facets of, of recreation. And the one theme that came out when we were putting this permit in 12 years ago or so was we don't want to use it for enforcement. So that's, that was the starting point for us. And so we really haven't considered using it for enforcement for, for a number of different reasons. Commissioner Amadon. Yes, uh, thank you, Khalil. Um, I think uh, I think this is a good question in that uh, it, we should always support the enforcement of our regulations. Um, and as most of you know, no one advocates harder for additional staff and additional budget uh, for the MEP. Um, I, I work uh, closely with uh, Colonel Santos in making sure that they are continuing to get more people on board. Unfortunately, they just lost a, another small batch of guys due to the uh, vaccination requirements. Uh, but they have been adding to their forces about 10 per year uh, and then losing maybe five per year through attrition. So it's been a very slow progress. Um, I, I'd like to offer two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll work with uh, Director McKiernan to have uh, his financial people, Kevin Creighton, along with my CFO, Brian Kelter, uh, look at this. Brian Kelter is, is an expert in understanding uh, the conundrums of wallop roll monies and, and where that stands. The other thing I can do is I can put uh, my legal team on the field for this to see exactly how they feel about it, uh, whether or not it's, it's appropriate. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, because of the advocacy of many other people uh, like myself um, for the MEP, especially throughout the, the past 18 months of uh, added pressure from COVID, there has been... Um, additional light shed on the importance of the numbers of these people out there providing the enforcement for our regulations. And I do know for a fact that there are several people working to identify additional sources of money uh, for the MEP. And I think, and I hope that we will begin to see their numbers grow by a little bit quicker pace beginning next year. So, Yes, we should look into this. It may be a bit premature. We may not need it uh, with some of these federal monies coming our way. But I always like to have a plan A and a plan B. So I'd be glad to, um, to work with the people that I've mentioned to take a look at the reality of this or the possibility of this. And then as I continue to um, find out more because of my advocacy, I often get asked to weigh in on on things like this as i learn more i'll bring that back to this table thank you thank you director uh commissioner excuse me director mccarran yeah uh, thanks khalil um patrick I, I understand that the nature of your inquiry is sort of conceptual and i appreciate that um i i do want to say that the marine fisheries advisory commission has had some success uh, bringing this issue to the attention of the secretary and the governor. And I don't know, like two or three years ago, I think, Ron, you, you were, when you first came on right prior to, there was a letter uh, written by the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission under the chairman's signature, uh, bringing forward the, the, uh, the argument that the mass environments of police were inadequately funded given their, um, given their role. And at the meeting last week, um, when we demonstrated a 30% increase in the value of seafood in Massachusetts, and that would be ex vessel value. Uh, the first thing that one of our members who is a prominent uh, representative of a commercial fishing group said was, 
we need more environmental police. I mean, it's, you know, with, with the increased uh, value of, of seafood, the, the, uh, the poaching uh, temptations even greater. And so, you know, it might be worthwhile. Um, again, I, I respect that this is a, a conceptual discussion, but if we want to get more environmental police, you know, this panel may, may want to maybe join forces with the uh, Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission and write maybe two, two separate letters, one on the one on the general side and one on the recreational side about that. Um, as Mike said, you know, this budget isn't very big and, and we're, we're desperate to come up with more money to, uh, to fund these uh, infrastructure projects. I was anticipating that's where additional monies, if we could get them would be spent. But um, anyway, just, just consider that. I, I think when Chairman Ray Kane uh, signed that letter, I think it turned some heads because um, you know, my, my sense is that the Mass Environmental Police's number one advocates are people on this call and, and people at the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission. We really understand the value of their, of their efforts and their role in, in, in us successfully managing these fisheries. And, and I think it's important when we weigh in, um, I think it was well received. So that's all, thanks. Uh, I'd like to re respond to that. Thanks, uh, Director McKernan. Uh, I think it's a great idea uh, regarding the letter. Um, and uh, if there are no objections from the panel members, um, I I'd like, to, uh, if I could speak with you uh, privately, sidebar uh, about this, uh, maybe we can begin to, you know, draft or formulate a letter. Uh, Commissioner Amadon, I see your hand is up. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Director McKinnon is spot on. Um, that letter that was written did uh, make um, a lot of progress. That is a large reason as to why we're seeing the additional 10 a year being brought through the, the academy. Um, I think the timing is actually very good. If, if this panel, as well as the MFEC, could renew that request, I think um, it would be appropriate, and I think uh, it would be well received. So um, I, I would agree with the director that I think um, your timing is spot on. I, I'd, I'd go ahead and, and do exactly that. Thank you. Uh, director McKiernan, how, how, how would we progress? Um, move forward on the, on the letter. Can you give, give me uh, give us a little bit of a... Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, what we can do is um, work with you, Khalil, and um, develop some talking points. And um, maybe over the next uh, few weeks, you could get, um, you know, buy-in from the, from, the, from the board, from this, I'm sorry, from this panel. Um, you know, if there's no objections, you could send it along, but, um, you know, you know, Patrick, maybe you want to you want to bring forward, you know, at this time, like what some of your specific talking points are, if you if you think that we need, and I think you do think we need more enforcement. Um, do you want to bring those to our attention, or do you want to send it to us in an email where you see the deficiencies? Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'd be happy to do that. Um... I'd be happy to put something together in writing and send it to you, Dan, you know, to, to whomever. Um, uh, the, I think a lot of what we, um, what we know, um, I don't think it's a hidden secret. Um, I don't think it's a hidden secret that there are areas such as the canal, um, such as certain public launch areas that are year in and year out um, hot spots of accusation and um, around um, open, wide open um, violation um, of fisheries regulation. Um, the um, there are absolutely certain fisheries that we see that happening, and as um, as all of the uh, as all of the communities have been facing more and more cutbacks, um, I think that. Obviously, as people see that they can take less and less fish, or um, and uh, or or their act their particular activity changes, they get um, 
naturally defensive, which becomes offensive very quickly. Um, I want to, I want to be very clear about something. Um, as a panel member and as the person who brought this up, bringing this up because I feel felt a responsibility because I hear it over and over and over again. That being said, um, I was one of that, a member of that steering committee, Mr. Ma, Mike, Mike Moss is still here. Um, you have all heard me during these meetings be very, very, uh, my, my level of scrutiny when it comes to even the anadromous program as to how appropriate it is under the, under fitting in here. Um, I would say that my feelings, my feelings about this issue were pretty strong. Um, like I believe there's plenty of money for enforcement in the actual state system as it is coming from the places that it traditionally does. And it's just a matter of prioritizing where the money goes. Um, I have personally, I have quite a few criticisms about the Massachusetts State Police budget and even the environmental police budget and how it and how it's split and where it's split. Um, that being said, I don't think it's the purview of this committee. Um, it was to do that work. Um, that um, I felt it needed to come up um, because people talk about it and go, what about the license money? And, and I want to be able to look at them and say that we've discussed it. Um, you know, for me, for me, not a dime of this money can go to that budget unless we know it is 100% going to go to, to saltwater fishing enforcement and only that that is extra over and above the natural charge of that, of that, of that entity. Um, but use of the fund aside, I'm um, for anything that we can do to support it. Um, um, I'm sure that even better than myself, that the leadership of the environmental police department could tell you where the need for, for heightened enforcement is, um, you know, I can, you and I, Dan, have had specific conversations about all the way down to actual individuals that are known. I live in the town of Hyannis where people shop backdoor striped bass on a regular basis and, um, and the, uh, to restaurants and the, and the Massachusetts Environmental Police cannot catch guys that we know are doing it. Not think that we know. I have no problem calling them out by name here. I just don't want to put us in the news. Um, but like there are issues going on that even the guys at the EPO are pulling their hair out about. And um, when those issues blow up on the internet and in today's world of social media, it enhances that cause about, well, what about this money? And what about that money? And um, um, this, this conversation today has given me enough as a member to look back at some of those guys and go here, this is what I learned and this is what's going on. Um, but as far as these ideas about going beyond and helping call, um, like I'm all for it, but I just like, you guys have already satisfied my, um, my question personally. And the reason that I put it on here and I appreciate the time given by everybody to it. Um, Cause um, when you look at it, I don't need to tell anybody here that ex state officials and ex policemen are not the easiest people to have a conversation about when they get it in their head that something should be done in a certain way. And I deal with that pretty regularly. And um, this conversation's helped me. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? I, I would just like to say that uh, my, my feeling is that the letter that we are going to craft uh, to talk about um, uh, law enforcement to increase uh, uh, the law enforcement for the environmental police is not to craft a letter to to request money from the uh, our budget, but rather to support the uh, the hiring of more uh, environmental police from uh, where that money would ordinarily come from in the first place. So, uh, I think uh, Director McCarran, am I am I correct on that assumption? Yeah, yeah. I, my guess is that here we are in December. Um, the the House is probably working on its budget. Um, you know, if if this letter were made part of the public record and people could shop it around, that the five prominent members of this panel who re represent you know a, a great cross section of the recreational fishing community all think that there's inadequate law enforcement, then even if it's too late to get into the governor's budget, um, then you know maybe a legislator could could pick it up. My suspicion is that there 
legislators don't get a lot of calls for more environmental police. And I know Sarah Peake has tried to advocate, um, but hasn't had as much success as she'd like. So I think just you know, general support of, of the environmental police budget um, is where it's at. You know, and um, we know that historically they they're high. About 20 years ago it was around 140 officers. Last time I checked it, it was about 75. There's a long way to go, um, and we all we all can feel that you know that that deficiency, especially when when the officers can't respond to a like a real time report because there's you know just at some moments we may only have one guy on 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 you know on a particular time within Cape Cod, and it's that person can't be everywhere. So I, I think that that's that a letter like this is a is a call for general support for the environmental police, maybe with some uh, essential statistics like the one I just mentioned, um, and just to get people's attention uh, moving forward. And as Mike Armstrong said, we don't really even have enough money in the fund to, to make that difference. You got to figure that each officer, when you outfit them with all the equipment and the vehicle and all that, that, you know, it's probably at least a buck and a quarter to, uh, and I'm just throwing that number out there to, to create one new position. And, you know, I don't, I don't, the entire budget of, our, of the rec panel that oversees may only get you like 10 officers, you know? So I'm not sure um, that, that, uh, that this is the right place for it anyway, but, but you, you're all involved in the industry. Um, you all, um, you're prominent, uh, you know, uh, kind of influencers. And I have a feeling that, that that's, uh, that's the kind of support that they need. Thank you, Director. I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch with you to, to see how we progress on this. Um, all right, let's move to the last item on the agenda. I think we're moving along fairly well, too. We're right on, right on time. Uh, other business and panel member comments. Um, is there any other business? If not, I don't see any hands. Um, um, Mike PR and Mac has to go off to a, another meeting. So for, for mem panel member comments, I'll begin with Mike PR and Good, uh, Khalil, thank you. Okay, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just, I didn't get a chance to chime in there. I just wanna thank Patrick for bringing that up. It is probably, you know, in my position, every time we talk about the permit, probably the number one thing I hear is about um, enforcement activities. And it isn't even necessarily, I, if I'm gonna buy a permit, I wanna support enforcement. It's why should I buy a permit when there isn't even enough money there for enforcement or I don't see enough enforcement. So I think um, doing a, a, you know, writing that kind of letter, I support that, I think that's great. Um, one other thing I just wanted to bring up is, is earlier in the, um, the permit presentation, being down 10%, um, you know, that's, to me, that's that's not okay. That's a little, you know, a little alarming. I know what's going on. It's going on across all recreational fishing. Last year was weird, but at the same time, I'm just wondering, being down 10% and also being down even a larger percentage in um, in the I think it was resident permits. Um, you know, and I, I don't need an answer right now, but I'm just curious what's being done or what has been done to try and gain some of those people back or to get back to something close to the levels that, that, you know, we had last year. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Kevin, I mean, excuse me, Mike Moss. Comments? Is Mike still? Hi, uh, am I on? Yes, you are, Mike. Good. A little unskilled with this process. I think we had a very good uh, meeting. I hope that things will move forward like we intend to. And I'll hold my comments on the law enforcement. I think they were pretty well covered. But much thanks to uh, Ross, Mike, and Dan, and all the others that do this work, especially to Nicola. She's the dumping girl, I think. We put everything on her, she gets it done. Thanks for uh, listening to my views and uh, thanks for all the work you do. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Patrick? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will just say that um, 
that uh I, and I don't know that we say it enough or that I say it enough, but um, it's pretty cool to be a member of this panel. Um, I, I, we lost a member of our community, um, of the public access community out in New York, a sort of legendary guy, um, a guy by the name of Billy Lemnicki died yesterday. And he was the first, um, one of the founders of a group called the United Mobile Sport Fishermen, um, which is the national beach buggy um, access group. And um, the communications with that I have with people up and down the coast, guys um, from the from the you know the from the sporting from the sport marine fishing related sport fishing club network, um, it's pretty cool to know there's no state besides Florida that comes close to getting the services out of their licenses we do here in Massachusetts, and um, this is something special like this thing that we do here. Um, even though there are days that I'm sure that every single one of us wants to bang our head in the wall, um, or whatever, um, there's very few places in a country that get as much out of their license as we do. And, um, it's a credit to everybody involved, especially like the staff of DMF. Um, cause, um, and as much as I like to beat them up, um, this thing we got here is really special and I appreciate it. And I just wanted to make sure that, that we say that a little bit. Thank you, Patrick. Are there any other, are there any other comments or from the from the members that have attended that they might want to chime in on? If not, I um, we see no hands. I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank the presenters uh, for for preparing their presentations for us and all those who attended and. Um, I, I feel that the uh, that the, the panel members uh, contributed a great deal today, and, and, and I appreciate their comments and thoughts. And I look forward to uh, to our next meeting in May. And uh, if there is no other business, can I have a motion to adjourn? Mike Beardnock, motion to adjourn. Thank second, you. Patrick. Okay. Who did the second? Patrick. Patrick, thank you so much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you for attending.